Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ram. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me start the video. Hello. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Uh, So give it another minute to see some other folks join and okay. then we can start. All right. Also, if you can add your name to the meeting attendance. Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Quentin. Hello. A long time no see. Yes. Thanks for sending me that uh, comprehensive list of things that need to be done. Um, have some more time and I will uh, gladly help out if, if my help is needed. Good awesome. to see you guys in years. Yeah. Quentin, where are you now? The last time I see you, probably five or six years ago. You were still, I mean, by the time you were still, I'm still in I'm still in California doing software things. <laughs> um, that's never, nobody changed that. You just somehow, <laughs> where did you work on your software stuff? That is always an interesting topic. Yeah, no, I've been uh, all over the place. I worked at Facebook for a while <clears throat> uh, and I worked at Hyundai. Uh, yeah, lots of things. We'll catch up sometime. Um, if that's the place we can catch up, that'd be great. Are you still going to any of the CNCF meetings? I haven't for a while, to be honest. I've been kind of disengaged from the CNCF a lot. So um, that's part of what I'm here for, is just to see if I can help with anything. Yeah. Hopefully, right. I can get started. Sorry. Uh -oh. Sorry to interrupt. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we have uh, Zod, which uh, is an OCI native container registry. So yeah, take it away. Okay. Hello, folks. So my name is uh, Ram Kumar Chinchani. I am. I also go by Ram. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the project that uh, was accepted as a CNCF uh, sandbox project. It's called Zod, and it is a OCI native container image registry. So you can. Uh, get all the information that you need about Zot here at zotregistry.io. Um, so the the information in this meeting will be uh, it's it's a duplicate of what is available here. Um, so feel free to search and look up the articles and things like that. And the the project website is here. So we do a uh, uh, the releases of the binaries in two forms. One is you get uh, native binaries that we publish right here uh, for various platforms and architectures. Uh, we also publish them as uh, um, container images. So feel free to pick uh, whatever you feel like. So coming back, um, so the um, the agenda of this meeting is uh, um, um, keeping in mind the time. I will go over the project uh, in breadth mostly, give a little bit of the background of uh, where we came from and what the design choices, the rationale and things like that. And we can do a deep dive on any specific topic based on uh, time and uh, questions. So uh, we are a, so I'm, I'm the part of a Cisco infrastructure, uh, container infrastructure team at uh, Cisco Systems, uh, one among many in, uh, in the team. So the expertise in our team is uh, mostly Linux kernel systems, storage, networking, software distribution, it's most, mostly with systems platform kind of stuff. And we have been doing a lot of uh, uh, development using Golang for a while now. <clears throat> so the Zot project itself is, um, although it is oh, it originated in our group, 
uh, over a period of time, it has evolved. Um, we have gotten contributions from the community. We have taken feedback and uh, contributions from the OCI community. And also thanks to the CNCF uh, for uh, accepting this as a sample as well. So without all of these efforts, that would not be possible today. So let me just say that out right now. Um, so why did why do we why did we actually start this project? Right. So uh, this this started a couple of years ago. Um, at that time, um, a lot of our projects at Cisco were getting containerized, like many other places, and uh, we needed a strategy for. Uh, building our container images and distributing our container images. So that was a, that was a requirement. And when we went out to look for a lot of these things, the, uh, the OCI community and their uh, specifications were just coming out, the runtime, the, uh, the distribution and so on. Uh, they, were, they were still very early stages. So we had to make a call. Do we uh, stick with, uh, say, uh, Docker standards that were there, or do we get on board with OCI? So the choice there was uh, moving forward, we want to open community standards. So we chose OCI and um, and uh, that's that's where our journey began. So uh, as we were looking around at that time, there were lots of gaps in terms of how the container images uh, were built, the registries and things like that. So. Uh, so that's when we started two projects. One of the projects was Zot, which is the registry project. And um, uh, one of the earliest involvements for, uh, that uh, we did with the community was to get involved with the OCA distribution spec. So it was still in 1.2, I believe. And uh, uh, it, turned, it turned out that a lot of our CACD unit tests that uh, we had in Zot could actually be ported over as conformance tests for OCA distribution spec. So that's that's how we got involved with the community, and we have been with the community since. Uh, so this is the overall, just to put uh, uh, things in perspective. So this is how things uh, look like for us, and for anyone who wants to uh, take on um, uh, building a OCA native uh, software supply chain. So the source code in the water form by developers uh, being built and packaged with at least in our case, it's Stacker, but it could be any other thing that produces OCI uh, uh, images. And then you can push it to a OCI native registry, which is ART, and then you can deploy it using Cryo on Kubernetes, and uh, you can do the image verification, pronouns, and things like that with Cosine. So this is a typical workflow that we have, and it is possible to do this end-to-end -end today. And, um, um, and, and, and this is the role, uh, this is the position ART takes. So if you really distill Zot in all its, you know, just to, it, it boils down to two things. Um, one is it is on the wire, it uses the OCA distribution specification and on the disk, it uses the OCA image format. That's it. So if you have these two specifications in hand, you can pretty much understand all of Zot. Um, and we follow these uh, specifications very religiously. In fact, um, one of the questions that get asked is, uh, do, you do you support Docker? Uh, the answer is no, because um, this is meant to be just an OCA uh, registry. But that doesn't mean that you cannot interact with Docker. You can obviously copy images from Docker over to, uh, um, over to Zot and So these are all the clients that work with uh, Zot. And you copy over uh, an image from Docker to Zot like so. So as long as you run your uh, Zot somewhere, let's say port 5000, then you say uh, the key is this. So as, as long as you're able to say that, then you can copy Zot over, uh, uh, images over. And these are all the clients that we support. So um, Zot is actually a manager of OCI layout. So that means given, given uh, any OCI layout, Zot can serve it. And conversely, if you push images to Zot, they get stored as OCI layouts. So 
So um, the other aspects of our release process and things like that. Uh, so our model is a single binary model. So everything that you get, all features, you will get uh, uh, um, compiled into a single binary. To run Zot, you don't need any special process privileges. Um, all features are included. So you don't need to do any. Uh, so the only thing that you may need to do is based on your deployment, you uh, 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 customize your configuration. But other than that, um, it's the same binary, whether it is for uh, embedded systems like Raspberry Pis, or do you want to run it on bare metal, or you want to deploy it in Kubernetes, uh, it's the same binary. Um, we also support multiple platforms, which is uh, Linux, Mac OS, um, yes, and again, ARM and AMD and things like that. So that's, that's the breadth of uh, things that are applicable here. So uh, the way that uh, the way that we uh, uh, build our binaries, um, which I'll get into the next slide, is uh, we have the ability to build just the binary with uh, uh, the OCI distribution, uh, the OCI specs, um, and you can prune out the rest of the features. So this is useful for people who are very security minded and want to reduce the attack surface. The less code that is compiled in, the less the, the lower the attack surface. So that's the rationale. At the same time, if you are um, feature minded, you want to get more features, then you can compile whatever you want in. And you may choose to enforce security outside of uh, uh, Zot. Uh, recently, um, the, uh, there has been an effort in the OCI community to generalize uh, the kinds of things that get uh, uh, published into these registries, which is not only container images, but uh, auxiliary data such as uh, software below materials, um, uh, CV reports and things like that. So OC uh, Zot also supports that, and uh, we have an asterisk there because the uh, there are some revisions that are undergoing, and as soon as they are finalized, that will become a part of Zot as well. So the architecture of Zot is like this. So outside of the box, uh, we have clients interacting with uh, Zot, and they interact with uh, or HTTP APIs. Um, the common across, uh, so uh, the, the, like I said, there are two flavors here. One is the full and the minimal, and the boundary is like so. So in the minimal build, uh, we just have the storage, um, all the storage related stuff, um, and uh, and and the configuration, access control, authentication, all of that stuff is uh, common to both flavors. And in the full build, we also uh, build in all the various extensions that we have found useful over a period of time. And it's your and if you if you um, uh, want to, so we when we publish images, we publish a minimal image and a full image. But uh, developers who want something in between, let's say that uh, I just want the minimal image and only the one of one or one one or more of the extensions, then you you can always build that in, and it's it's fairly straightforward to do that. Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can do that. So you will do something like this. You will say, uh, "I just want the minimal with um, uh, with uh, uh, the sync extension." So it will build just that part in and not bring in other extensions. So this is a so it's the it, it covers the entire spectrum of things. Yeah, great. Okay, so that's the uh, question about this. Is, so, uh, do you also check for vulnerabilities or for some? Yes, of yes, yes, yes. As a part of our, so let's take a look at our our CI/CD pipeline. I think the questions that uh, um, so our, uh, when we do the release of our binaries, these are all the things that we check. Uh, so, uh, all the unit tests that get covered, we um, um, check for a, uh, we actually deploy a, a, a clustering test, the code quality, whether uh, all the ecosystem tools such as uh, Scopio, um, ORAS and things like that work with uh, this. Um, we do our linting, we, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So basically benchmarking tests, black, various black box tests, there is a security scan because we, have, we also do UI. So the, all of these tests are built in for every PR that needs to get merged in goes through all of these tests. So, um, so we take uh, the, the code quality very seriously and, um, and I'm hoping to stick with that. 
It makes sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I mean, this is great. I mean, you, you can actually build uh, a minimal binary, and so that for some orgs might be more useful. You know, to have a, a smaller attack vector, right? That's that's correct. Exactly, exactly. That is the thinking. So you, uh... could I could I just continue with that question? I, I might not have fully understood the answer, but uh, it looked like those tests you showed a moment ago were were against the Zot code base. Is that correct? So those that is all... correct. Yes, yes. But do you, do you do the same? Do you, do you have mechanisms for doing similar sorts of tests against the containers that you uh, host? Is there any uh, sort of vulnerability checking on the container? Oh, okay. So you are talking about uh, the features. Yes. So um, if Zot is a registry and you put, uh, you you basically uh, push images to it, then do we have a ability to scan the container images, images that got pushed into Zot? So the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, so let me give an example of. So this is a, a public uh, uh, instance that we run, which is exactly the binary that gets published. And as, as a part of publishing these images, uh, we also do these uh, container images scans. And uh, we'll have to see why that is happening, but we do support it. And I see there's another related question in the chat here. Okay. Uh, do, do we uh, sign or support sign? Yes, that is correct. Yes, we support that too. So the the two formats that we support are it is compatible with cosine, and it is also compatible with uh, notation, which is a more recent project that is coming up. So both of them are supported. So that is also uh, that is also included as a part of our uh, uh, of of our pipeline. So if you take a look at the um, Uh, let's see if I can get that right push for okay, here we go. Yeah, maybe this one. Yeah, there you go. So um so these are these are part of our test. So every PR that it gets published also has to go through this, so it doesn't break uh, compatibility with these clients. Okay. And then um, just out of out of interest, um, a, a lot of, I, I can imagine there being a potentially unlimited set of uh, tests and checks and security vulnerability tests, etc., that may need to be done against uh, containers. Is this done through your extension mechanism, or is this uh, sort of baked into into Zot? Oh, it is uh, it, the the um, the feature that does the uh, vulnerability scanning is an extension. Okay. Yeah, but but you get that image. So when you when you build when you get the full image, or you just take that part of the image, you will get the ability. Okay, and and, and so if I wanted to do additional checks, I, I would either would I have to make changes to that extension or could I just chain my own additional extensions? Ah, okay. Uh, you can add your own extension, um, but that would have to be a PR. So it's not a, something that is dynamic. So for example, you cannot just put a dot .so somewhere and then... Uh, uh, okay, um, so it's, make it's fundamentally dot. part of Zot. I got you. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct, yes. Okay. <clears throat> An additional question related to that: Do you support like standard uh, container vulnerability scanners like Trivi? Yeah, Trivi. Yeah, Trivi is the backend that we use. Okay, great. Okay. So, so. Yeah. But uh, just note that uh, as we uh, start moving uh, towards things like S bombs and uh, stuff like that, then the the way we report vulnerabilities also sorts of changes because we can we can cause uh, uh, correlate with the bill of materials and then report vulnerabilities and stuff actually unpacking the image and scan it. so there are there are things that are evolving there yeah makes sense okay so the the these are the extensions that are available today so if you think there are um, uh, any others any others that needed to be added please let us know and we will definitely take a look at that so the things that we have today are so the one um, 
uh, extension that a lot of people come and ask us about is uh, uh, the sync extension. So we have, a, can we run a local ZOT and fetch images from all these various registries and then use this registry as our uh, as a part of our pipeline? So this is the question, right? So the answer is yes. Uh, if you have the sync extension, then you can basically say I can have one or more upstream registries like so and uh, set up a, the sync configuration and the clients can basically talk to the local zot as if, uh, uh, I mean, transparently and the, all these images land there. So the images land there via, via two mechanisms. One is the um, on-demand mechanism. So whenever clients want a particular image, then it can pull that image down. Uh, also, it can do a, a periodic uh, scan of images. That means it can get a, a subset of subset or all of images upstream based on configuration, and they land on Zot. And after this point, the clients can just interact with the local Zot to uh, get their images. Now, the there is a slight caveat that um, uh, most of the images that get published here are Docker images uh, upstream, like Docker and Zot, because that's just the nature of the ecosystem. And there are some OCI images. So if you do signatures and things like that, uh, then those signatures happen to be on Docker image content. And when you pull them down as OCI, they gets converted on the wire, but you lose the, the signature. So you might have to resign them again. So there's just a caveat there. So the workflow here is uh, very similar to Git clone. So every Git clone is a full rep repository. Similarly, we want every Zot instance you can set up to be a, a fully functional mirror. And note that the, the downstream ZOD that you have could become an upstream ZOD for someone else. So you could have set up a, another uh, uh, ZOD instance to use this as the thing. So you could chain it indefinitely, right? So this is, so this is basically very similar to the Git clone functionality. And, uh, and because, the, uh, because Docker Hub has been doing a lot of uh, rate limiting and it could be any other registry doing rate limiting, it's always useful to have a, a local copy of those images to work with. So this is the uh, so this has been uh, in all in all of the extensions. This is probably one of the extensions that people are have been very interested in. The second extension is uh, the search extension, and uh, uh, the search extension is uh, basically uh, if you look at the distribution spec APIs, uh, the ability to search there is very very limited. Um, just, just the nature of the API. So what we have done is we have added a GraphQL extension, uh, you know, sort of, a, it's, 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 it's lot, it, the model is basically SQL across all these APIs. So you can do as interesting searches like that. So for example, um, let's say, so the, whatever you're seeing is, is being driven off that extension. Um, The, the ability to look at the tags, uh, then you can think use you can do things such as uh, this container image. What it has been based on some other image. Then what are the images that it was based on? Similarly, it can also say if this container is, uh, if there are other container images that are using this image, what are they? And uh, if there are any vulnerabilities in this image, then what are the vulnerabilities? So all of these are basically served off this search ex extension. Okay. This is great. So so you you can also search by different tags, right? Like on container yes, tags. Right? That's correct. So uh, let's say this is an older image, but let's just say. Uh, I could say things like, yeah, so I could say things like uh, like that. So if you put a colon, then it automatically starts searching by tags. Okay. So these are all the types of queries uh, that you can do. So the, uh, the users of this interface are uh, developers who want to look up a, a image name and things like that. Then there are also release managers who want to say, should I use this? What are the CVs? What products get affected? How do I fix them and things of that nature? So, uh, so that's the uh, the use case for this uh, this particular extension. 
Then there is the lint extension. So where we have found this useful is, uh, let's say you build an image and you want to push that image, but we can sort of enforce some policies uh, for regulatory compliance. So for example, um, an example would be, let's say that you want to make sure that um, uh, the images that get pushed have certain fields, um, certain fields are annotations in them before you push them. So for example, we could say, you enable this extension like so and say, I want to make sure that this container image has the author field set, the license field set, and things like that. So if none of these fields are set, if one or more of these fields are not set, then uh, the image push will fail with the appropriate error message. So uh, this basically makes sure that your um, images have all the metadata and uh, they are annotated. So, so this is this is one of the uh, one of the extensions that we have found useful for um, for our regulatory compliance. <clears throat> okay, and then there is the scrub extension. So, uh, it is possible that the storage that uh, you use for Zot uh, may or may not be a reliable storage. Mm, so, even if it's reliable, it can it can have uh, errors that can pop in there. So. The scrub extension is a is a periodic uh, process that goes ahead and uh, verifies the image content uh, proactively. So it's 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 doing the Shasen checks on all of them. And whenever the Shasen check doesn't match the claim on the the, the digest on uh, the the digest, then basically it flags an error right away. So um, this is basically to make sure that. Uh, there are there are no uh, there uh, you're not affected by things like bit rot and things like that and if you do then you are uh, you don't wait till the very last minute when clients pull and push these images but you report them proactively so it can be rectified right? so the metrics extension is something that we added which is uh, which integrates with the prometheus stack so uh, this is useful mainly for the operators of Zot uh, SREs, and we track uh, a quite a significant number of SLIs on them. Things like uh, the latencies, the kind of uh, methods that are getting pushed, the throughput that we are seeing, and things of that uh, nature. So all of this is so if you have the Prometheus stack. So this is useful when if you want to deploy Zot in say Kubernetes, right? So this is this is now uh, so all of this is supported via the metrics extension. So all you need to do is go to the configuration, say extensions, metrics, enable, and this comes free. So the UI extension. So in the 2.0 release, which is our next uh, major release, we are also including the UI, and that UI has been, uh, uh, like I said, see, this is this is what you're going to get, and this is included in the same binary. So if you launch the binary, the UI comes free, and this binary, as you can see, it runs on Max and Raspberry Pis and anything. So all of them get this UI. Nothing special. And this is uh, this is uh, aligns with our uh, batteries included model. So um, in terms of the, uh, so yes, I mean, we have been using Zot internally in, our, uh, in Cisco for, for our products, but externally as a community outreach kind of, uh, in, in that context, we have uh, um, people who have reached out to us. So a lot of them want to run Zot with uh, sync enabled. So this is, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very popular feature. Um, some things that we have seen as registries that are, uh, so they want to run a registry in embedded systems for all their updates. Um, um, and Rock was one of the projects that reached out to us. So this is, so one of the, uh, the feedback that we got was, it's a very tiny binary. So it's very, um, it is very suitable for embedded systems. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's just one thing, one small thing. We have, uh, uh, we're also, um, we are also in uh, the CI/CD pipelines. Whenever you want your OCI display conformance, so if, if there are projects that want a, a strict OCI registry, then Zot is what you want to deploy in their pipelines to to uh, uh, to work against. Zot is also a Helm registry. So Helm has uh, the recent uh, versions of Helm have also so are supporting uh, the OCI registry. So you can actually deploy Zot via Helm, and you can use the deployed Zot as a Helm registry. Um, so that is that is one of the uh, use cases that we have, and uh, Zot is uh, is is uh, has been added to the Chain Guards Wolfie distribution, their distro. So Zot is one of the um, packages that got added there. So these are some of the use cases that we have seen. Um, 
so in terms of the so how does our roadmap get decided so um the first and foremost we align with the oci community standards very closely so the oci community standards is a roadmap for us automatically and uh, that is sort of our social contract as well so whenever we do any releases here we will conform very strongly to uh, the specs that come out of the oci community then uh, the other way the roadmap gets decided is through external use cases so people come out and reach out to us can you support this can you do this can you add this feature and things like that and then there is the uh, at least in the early days we have the internal zot team which decides uh, what do we need to put on our CICD pipelines? How do we improve them and things like that? So whatever it, whatever the case may be, uh, at least for us so far, we have stuck to a social contract that we will, whatever way we solve this problem, we want to solve it in the context of the OCA community specs. So that is our sort of the North Star uh, whenever we do an implementation. Uh, so 2.0 is going to be our next major release, and that will include the UI. So it's it's sort of a um, self-contained uh, release. Um, you can you can you can launch that binary and do um, many things with it, including the UI. So if you have any um, GitHub issues, I mean, even if you run Zot and if you run into issues, feel free to uh, feel free to uh, file issues here. Uh, we are also at uh, we also hang out at uh, the CNCF. Uh, Zot channel, which is so feel free to ask questions here. We have we do get a lot of questions here too. How do we run that? How do we run? So so this is something you can reach out to us we, we, and, and we'll respond. So if there are any other questions, so you can um I had one quick one. Um I was just wondering roughly how long you guys have been around for. So so when your first release was. And and what uh, aspirations, if any, you have of of getting to incubation status? Uh, so we are very interested in getting into incubation status. And in terms of the history, uh, let's see. So we have been. So the first release was probably in two thousand nineteen or so. Um, so it's been a while. And. Uh, um, and we are we are uh, um, making some changes to make sure that we are a part of the incubation, right? To make uh, opening up the uh, project for more community members and things like that. So this is roughly where. Uh, let's see if we have any. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That that answers my yeah, question. Yeah. So it's 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 been yeah it's been a while. So. Yes. Yeah, we're happy to help you out if you, I mean, if you have any questions about that, then oh, it sounds good. Any, anything that, you know, can help you interact with CNCF or CNCF DOC, then we, we're happy to help. Thank you. All right. I think there is a, one more project coming up a presentation. So if you have any other questions, that is the end of my presentation. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, Homin. So. Thank you. Uh, Grace, please, uh, thank you. Uh, now let me just uh, share my screen first. Um, so this is, um, give me a sec. Yeah. So this is a presentation. Um, I work with the community. So my name is Huan Ming Chen. Um, join with me, um, people, you know, uh, Kepler community, uh, because of the time zone differences, they are not able to join us today. Uh, so I will just play their recordings. Uh, so if you have further questions, you can always ask me or the Slack channel. We can more than happy, more than happy to answer your questions. So what we are trying to do here today is to give an overview of what the project Kepler is about and uh, uh, the internals and us and the deliverables we have and hopefully to address the, uh, to make some connections between Kepler and the CNCF communities. Um, so just a little bit of a, a, a reflection of what uh, my interaction with the tech runtime is about. So I worked up with uh, many folks in uh, tech runtime. I started with Kubernetes. I got to know Quinton a long time ago and I uh, made a lot of contributions to Kubernetes storage. And also along the way, I have been working on projects, uh, KubeVirts, and uh, also working with people in the Kira. And as a matter of fact, we had a um, 
POCs with Kira team how to use um, carbon accounting to reduce, uh, to make intelligence decisions for Kira uh, to have uh, the scalability is based on carbon intensity. Um, the idea of Kepler is along the lines of how can we account for workloads, energy consumption. So if you are running your containers, your virtual machines or service functions, uh, oftentimes people ask uh, is, uh, how much is my workload's energy consumption is about and what's the profiles uh, I can get and how can I optimize the workload consumption so I can, can reach my sustainability goals, reduce the carbon, uh, uh, reduce the carbon footprint and uh, reduce the energy consumption. So capital um, comes to play. Uh, it's using the CNCF native technologies in terms of uh, um, what we are built on top of. So the, as the name suggests, it's a Kubernetes-based efficient power level exporter. And it's also uh, just the inspiration from the uh, astronomer uh, Johannes Kepler, who uh, famously declared the three laws of a planet's movement. Uh, the observability that we are want to guess here is to see how your workloads consumes energy within your Kubernetes cluster. So at the moment, we are able to get uh, uh, the energy consumption based on your processes, containers, and the parts. And we are able to report both the CPU, GPU, and DRAM energy consumption. And in the future, we are also going to account for other components such as the networking, storage, and the specialized hardware. Uh, we currently support bare metal as well as your virtual machines. So if you run Kepler, we can get the uh, energy consumption on that environment. If you're running Kepler on virtual machines where there's no uh, power consumption meters are available, we are using machine learning models to help you to calculate the energy consumption on that environment. Uh, we support x86, that's including Intel and the AMD chips, as well as the ARM. Uh, we do not support every ARM vendors uh, because um, not every ARM vendor has the same interface to expose their energy consumption from the chips. Uh, also, three, uh, uh, IBM's mainframe architecture is under the development as well. Uh, in order to reduce the uh, resources, that's to get capital into the calculation, we use in the EBPF. Um, we will have this uh, diagram later to see how use EBPF is in this picture to collect information that Kepler needs to calculate the energy consumption. And the very last, we use in, uh, machine learning models uh, to calculate energy consumption. Uh, the rough idea is that uh, we get all this information from the system that's including the CPU, uh, CPU instructions, CPU cycles, cache misses, and C group metrics. And we're using that to uh, build up to train machine learning models. That will tell us how much uh, energy consumed, consumed by each of these factors. And then these machine learning models is then used to do the inference for as the process and container level to uh, calculate the energy consumption as this granularity. Um, Starting from there, um, we have a strong community. Uh, even the project is still very young. Uh, the, it was actively joined by uh, lots of community members. Uh, maybe I can quickly show what we have already in the GitHub repos. So this is the, our organization called Sustainable Computing IO. Our uh, Kepler is the, by, uh, is the demon sets that's, uh, this, uh, that's the uh, heavy lifting. Uh, at the same time, we also have the deployment models by using the operator and Helm charts. Uh, Kepler is really uh, using a lot of uh, machine learnings. So uh, you see here we have the model server and the estimator. These are the way, uh, these are the uh, repos to host uh, the um, you know how we explain models, how do we use the models using different languages, uh, so that you can run it in a sidecar. And uh, we also using Kepler to build up other. Um, the utilities for upstream community to use. Uh, one of the things is uh, called um, uh, Kepler Action. So this is uh, basically a GitHub Action. If you are running a Kubernetes and have a workload running Kubernetes, you want to have your CICD pipelines to account for the energy consumption by your workloads. You can use these GitHub Actions to do so. Uh, we have a demo in this talk as well. I don't know how much time we have it have for this talk. Uh, I will just play the demo or play the video. Yeah, we have we have about twenty minutes, so it's good. Okay, maybe I can just do a selective playing. So I will go first go to the architecture and then show the uh, the um, uh, the deployments and also show how the GitHub action works. 
And for the rest of the information, I will share with you the slide deck so you can always play it offline. All right, let's just play the video. Hello, everyone. I'm can you hear me, by the way? from IBM Research Tokyo. Yep. Yep. I'm going to introduce okay. the Capra architecture. Uh, Capra is the efficient power level exporter based on Kubernetes project. Here's the list of the contributors. Sorry if I'm missing someone. Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry. I'm Marcel Amaral from <laughs> IBM Research Tokyo. Capra is the efficient power level exporter based on Kubernetes project. Here's the list of the contributors. Sorry if I'm missing someone. Okay, so Kepler is a framework that is composed by multiple power models that can be applied to various scenarios, for example, for different CPU architecture or using different metrics, depends on the metric availability. Um, also, uh, the Kepler frameworks aims to provide public available power model from the community to be shared with the community. That is, the community can share data from different CPU architecture, we can create power models for that, and this can be reused um, for the community in different contexts. So our modeling approach can be can use different power metrics from various power sources. For example, the Intel Rappel that collects the power consumption of the CPU and the DRAM typically, and also, the motherboard sensor that collects the energy consumption of the entire motherboard and can be accessed by the CPI sensors. And also the hardware counters that we collect using uh, eBPF. And where eBPF is a tool that enables the kernel extension without the need to recompile the kernel. So it can be, we can collect metrics more efficiently with eBPF. Okay, so uh, the different power models can be created and applied depends on the context. So if the system has real-time power metrics or harder counters uh, or not. For example, if it's running directly with the bare metal, it's running on the VMs, but of course, the availability of the metrics impacts in the occurrence of the model. Okay, so uh, to ensure fairness in our power model, we follow the green gas protocol recommendation, that is, split the constant power, that is, which is the idle power, based on the user resource allocation, and the dynamic power based on the resource utilization. So, additionally, Kepler has low overhead when collecting the harder counters, because of the in-kernel implementation using BPF, as I mentioned before. Uh, Kepler is composed by multiple modules that can be optionally deployed. For example, the main module is the metric exporter and the other modules can be optionally deployed depends on the context. The metric exporter module collects metrics and calculates process and container power consumption. So the metric exporter module has internally two different power models. The ratio that uses CPU instructions to divide the dynamic power among the process and the linear regression that uses more metrics than only CPU instructions but needs to be pre-trained for a given system uh, by collecting metrics. And for more advanced power models, for example, using algorithms for linear regression, uh, we have the model server and, uh, and uh, energy estimation. So the model server receives data from the metric exporter to train the new uh, power model, okay? So, and this, this can train, the, the, the new power model can be trained using nonlinear regression alg uh, algorithms. Uh, and the energy estimation model receives the power model uh, pre-trained pre -trained par parameters along with the process resource utilization to calculate the power consumption. So, in this case, um, both the model server and the energy estimation estimator 
uh, are implemented in Python because Python has more available statistics libraries. Okay, so just an overview how everything is done, um, how the, the whole process works. First, all the select first we select the uh, uh, a set of widely available metrics such as CPU instructions, cycles, cache, what's the metrics that will be used for the power model. Then Kepler first calibrates to discover the idle power amp consumption. So which it can vary dif for different systems. Um, the idle power is used to calculate the dynamic power. And then by having the dynamic power and the resource utilization, we run the regression algorithm to create the power model. The output of the regression algorithm is actually the power model that we use it for inference uh, to calculate the energy consumption of containers. Okay, so thank everyone for the attention. This is the introduction of the Kepler architecture. Um, so I will just uh, pause here and uh, to show what uh, we have uh, in the system. So if you are looking at how what's the Kepler's metrics uh, can show us. So we build up uh, at the same time the dashboard for people to use. Uh, so if you are looking at uh, what's the panels, the, this is a Grafana uh, dashboard, by the way. So we can get on the right side of the panel, top right one, you can see the energy as a spent as a different component so on the CPU package, in the CPU core, GPU, and DRAM. On the middle panel, uh, the green bars, you can see the um, depends on your uh, time of the day, you have the calculator uh, metrics to show you the, as the namespace level, the energy consumption in aggregate. Uh, we can also show it in the pod level, uh, but this uh, dashboard does not show it uh, that way. Uh, there's uh, also other dashboard we build can show you both the uh, namespace level and, as well as the pod level. And if you also have the carbon intensity information, uh, we did it through some of the uh, public APIs to grab the carbon intensity from the power grid. We can also plus the power uh, trans uh, carbon intensity uh, data here by translating the amount of uh, power into the carbon. So that's what we offer uh, at the moment. So that is uh, what the uh, Kepler shows you as the end user. The next slide is about how Kepler runs the model server and uh, using the power estimator to estimate the power uh, consumption. The, I, will, I will probably just stop here because uh, this video is really for the advanced and experts use. Uh, if you are just an end user and if you are just for trivial testing, you probably don't use in the sophisticated configuration. I uh, will just leave this to the very end if you still got time. I will play this uh, the installation uh, in the uh, first. And then uh, this uh, we have two ways to install Kepler. One is through the operator, the other one is through home chat. So let's get to the demo. Uh, first, I'm going to show you how you can install a Kepler operator on an OpenShift environment. The first, the release that we have right now is V1 Alpha 1, and it has a prerequisite that it needs C group V2, and it follows Kepler 0.4 release, and it deploys Kepler both on Kubernetes and OpenShift. So when you're deploying it on OpenShift, it also pre-configure your OpenShift nodes by applying a machine config and um, uh, SCC. And uh, right now, Kepler uh, uses local linear regression estimator in Kepler main container with offline trained models. But um, in the next release, we are planning to provide end-to-end -end learning pipeline where it can train the model as well as use the model. Um, if you're interested in a uh, code, you can follow us on a GitHub repository. And uh, so let's get to, uh, to the demo. To deploy the operator, uh, go inside the Kepler operator project and uh, run the make deploy. That will uh, create all the manifest and install the operator in the namespace Kepler operator system. So now I'm just going to go into the Kepler operator system, the namespace. Uh, let's see if the operator has been, yeah. So you can see that the operator is running. Now I'm going to apply the CRD and wait for the Kepler instances to get started. 
So as you can see, uh, the Kepler instances are running and uh, they are uh, each of them is up and running and they are each of them are running on each of the uh, nodes as a daemon set pod. So that's why you see so many of them. And now I'm going to deploy Grafana. Give it a second. Yes, so Grafana is deployed. Now to enable user workload monitoring, I'm going to apply the config map and that ensures that the Prometheus in the user workload monitoring namespace is capturing the Prometheus metrics. So let's see if the pods are up and running in the OpenShift user monitoring project. As you can see that all the pods are running. So now to see the metrics, I'm just going to the Grafana URL. Uh, let's just sign in. And because we applied the Grafana operator, so the default Kepler dashboard should be available. Give it a second. It will load. Yeah, so now you can see uh, the energy reporting from Kepler. You can see the carbon footprint. You can see the power consumption in namespaces, total power consumption, pod process power consumption, and uh, total power consumption by namespace. So that's the default Grafana dashboard. Yes, um, I see uh, there's a question here. Um, uh, just for uh, clarification, the uh, API is kind of from Kavarana, uh, Singularity, that's all uh, energy. So you can have the uh, Python API, you can grab the information from there. Um, I use this as, um, for simulation. So this is what I built for the dashboard. And you can see at different locations, you have different carbon intensity. Uh, for the question, uh, second question, if uh, Quinton, if that's a question for Kepler, we have a documentation page. It's uh, showing what's the uh, uh, the metrics. Uh, that's a documentation about the uh, metrics Kepler does expose. And here you can find all this detailed uh, um, explanation what Kepler's metrics is about. For example, this uh, Kepler container joules total, that's where it comes for CPU, GPU, and DRAM energy that's uh, measured by Kepler. And if you can go into details like a CPU core and uh, Encore, that is uh, Intel architecture, you have core and Encore. Basically, the Encore is the graphics. Um, so that's what we, uh, let's just go to the next recording. Sorry, can, can we just go back to your answer there quickly? Um, oh, yeah, so sure. actually, that gets to the heart of, of what my question was actually. So those, okay. those, those metrics you're showing there, those are presumably just names of metrics and, uh, yes. and, and a programmatic level, um, uh, it's not easy to, for example, find out what the units are or what the meaning oh, of that. Okay. Yeah. Th those are just so, names, I think, and they kind of the, the name incorporates like what's being measured, what the units are, you know, mm -hmm. things. Uh, but yeah. programmatically, it's impossible to kind of figure that out. Uh, okay. So, so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. So, um, in a Prometheus, there's a two things we uh, we use. One is, the, as you said, this is units, right? So, with the units is the joules uh, um, in the energy. In energy. And we do not have watts yet, but uh, if you are just do a delta on the, between different timestamps, you can guess the watts number. And uh, some other things we also have, that is basically just counters. Um, for example, the CPU cycles, this is basically just the cycle on the counter. Okay, so it sounds, uh, you just have, it sounds like you just have keys and values and, and no yes. data about the, 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 the metrics. Okay, makes sense. Right. Yeah, so if you go to, for example, the uh, Prometheus dashboard, uh, you can probably, uh, this part is probably is already gone. Um, but you can also use some of the uh, dashboarding tools to help you to understand what is being always being shown over there. For example, these are what we show in Jules because this are uh, um, monotonically increasing. So this is uh, has been running for a while. Um, that's why you see these uh, millions of uh, Jules spend on this setup. Um, I'm just quickly playing. Sorry, it so, uh, so Heba has a question about the HPA um, in multi region. I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, the multi region, I think you answered this, you mean, uh, but uh, how about the HPA? Yeah, so if you are running HPA uh, at the moment, we only account for the part level, um, but if you want to aggregate to that, for example, the deployments, right, because HPA is basically just a scale up to a lot of parts, and uh, each part belongs to uh, deployments. 
we have plans to aggregate everything at the deployment level. So right now, Kaplan just de uh, demons that collects all the information as different nodes, what part, what uh, the part name, container name. They did, does not have this aggregation to the higher level API yet. So once we have this higher level API aggregation, you should be able to see um, from time to time what's the deployment, the single deployment energy consumption look like. So if you horizontally scale it, the number will show, you know, show the delta. Uh, yeah. If you have multiple regions, uh, so that is a very good point. Uh, so if you have multiple regions, obviously, um, I assume you are in this area, right? The BP area, the Portland uh, uh, Seattle area. So in that area, you will see the uh, carbon is much lower. Um, the BPA, the carbon is much lower than, for example, my region, uh, which is not, uh, New England. So in this place, you can take the advantage of the delta to schedule the carbon intensity delta to schedule workloads, um, you know, by your preference. The other way is um, if you are horizontally scale, you can also, you know, if you know your carbon uh, energy consumption in the first place, you probably can tune your energy, uh, tune your workload to optimize the energy in the first place. And then if you want to reduce the carbon, then you choose the right region to uh, to do it. So in one of these POCs, we worked with um, our Kira team. With, uh, we understand the carbon intensity and we have some uh, constraints on how much we can scale up and down uh, based on the carbon intensity. That is basically using the HPA. Um, so that is something we can consider in collaboration. And uh, you know, that's why we are here to understand the requirements and hopefully can share with you what we can help. Yeah, and the same thing for multi-tenancy as well. So right. uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you have multi-tenancy, as you have said, if you are in, uh, in different namespace, you can see uh, the uh, in the middle diagram, uh, in the middle chart. Uh, so the uh, namespace level energy can be accounted uh, by this, uh, you know, uh, by aggregating as a namespace level. So that is all possible. By the way, we also have the, you know, if I skip this one, we applied for CNCF sandbox, and I think we probably evaluated at the same time as thoughts, but somehow the question came to what's actually being donated to uh, the CNCF. We're actually donating everything, including the model server, estimator, capital installer, whatever. Uh, that question was not uh, well um, presented at the moment, so we are still waiting for the next round of uh, evaluation. Um, so yeah, so we are open to all kind of uh, collaboration and hopefully we can make our future su sustainable. Well, I think I probably run out of time. So maybe I can just share with you the slides or the uh, YouTube link uh, in this slide deck. So you can uh, play it as your free time and get yeah. more ideas about what we That'd do. That'd be great. Yeah, and, and you can yeah. share the tag runtime channel. You can share these and yeah. And yeah, then, definitely. Okay. I will upload the uh, slide over there. And if you yeah. want to, uh, if you like to join us on Slack, we have a Slack channel as well. So yeah, um, all kind of participation will be welcome. Yeah, I have a follow up question, but I can add, I can ping you offline. It's about the overhead of the model serving, but yeah. I'll, I'll oh, this it. is really small. That that is uh, what we keep in our heart to uh, everything you make changes. This footprint has to be very small. So we asked, we calculated the model server footprints. We also calculated the estimator's footprints in terms of resources. And the think about that they are not so uh, expensive to have. So we yeah. are able to put them in. The so it's not a really like a large model, right? So it's not a. If you, it's it's not, not, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's not a huge model. So we do not start using a lot of energy. Yeah. yeah so I, I have a question. Sorry. I know we have. Only one minute. Uh, so uh, can, 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 we, can we use this exporter with any other uh, like scalar um, tool? So, so for example, like the. The cluster autoscaler. I, I don't know. It's it's like any 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 other cluster autoscaler or uh, pod or you know like workload auto, autoscaler. Is that working or just for Kira? Um, so Kira is, is actually we are not uh, using that much of Kira. We are using the you know the web hooks to I think I forgot the name. Uh, the the Python based framework that can just yeah, do the web hook uh, uh, mutation. So that is something we use to up to change the uh, the replica numbers in Kira. But definitely, that can be in the same approach can be integrated with other scale as well. Uh, so we had a KubeCon. So that's probably the first time I met you, uh, Heba, if I got your name right. Uh, as KubeCon uh, uh, Detroit, we had a demo to show the VPA 
the uh, capital working with the VPA to scale up and down the resources for the container. If yes. you believe the container is using too much energy or just so we can, how can we reduce the energy consumption? So in this coming KubeCon as Europe, we are going to show yet another demo uh, using Kepler to work with Rook. And so we can guess the, guess the um, API level energy consumption. Uh, for example, if you are uploading something to S3 buckets, what's the energy consumption inside of Rook? So if you are doing like a multiple tenants, if you have multiple users in your organization, let's keep dumping into S3 buckets, you know, Rook uh, into API. Um, so that is something we can take into account and to give you some rough estimates of the energy consumption throughout this uh, life cycle. So uh, I think that's a, it requires a lot of creativity, but it's definitely doable. As long as you have the metrics in your hands, you can make a lot of things happen. And that's the intention. We want to have a CNCF ecosystem um, uh, you know, approval so we can have more people and have more projects to make them more efficient and uh, sustainable. Yeah, that would be great if if we can like um um you know like uh, make make this in, like independent from any other you know like scaling uh, options. So we can mm -hmm. we can invest more in in you know like Kepler project and anyone can integrate with it. Even you know like the maybe the cloud provider they wanted to integrate it you know like with their own uh, implementation. But it it would yeah. really really benefit more if we can right. think about you know like having this uh, levels of uh, separation yeah that's um why we make it open source and open standard so um we um so we present the whole uh, source code as open source we also want uh, hope of the community can share their models because not every setup we can have in-house to train a model uh, if you have a specialized hardware and that's we cannot uh, obtain uh, to do the model training hopefully the community can help us to build a repository of models so when people are using uh, running their specialized hardware, they can guess the model and uh, guess the understand, I guess, into uh, the understanding of their power consumption on their workload. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we can make a better future. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, we can follow up on the Slack channel. I think we're, we're out of time, but, but yeah, this was, this was great. So. Yeah. Rest to meet you all here. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.